Hello everyone, I'm Mike Blundell, Product Manager here at Biorad. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Dead or Alive on the ZE5, using flow cytometry to measure apoptosis. Your speaker today will be Sharon Sanderson, one of our research associates here at Biorad. Today's webinar is the fifth in our series of flow cytometry webinars. If you missed our previous four and are interested in watching our other flow cytometry webinars, they are available on demand at biradantibodies.com forward slash webinar. Sharon obtained a degree in molecular biology from the University of Manchester before moving to the Institute of Cancer Research, obtaining a PhD in cell biology from the University of London, with her thesis focusing on angiogenesis. Sharon then moved to the University of Oxford, where she worked for 13 years, initially continuing with research in the cancer field before moving into immunology research. Her most recent position was as a postdoctoral scientist in an autophagy laboratory, working on multiple projects involving conventional and imaging flow cytometry. Sharon moved earlier this year to join Biorad as a flow cytometry research associate, working on the new ZD5 cell analyzer. As we are trying to make this webinar as interactive as possible, please submit questions or comments via the Q&A box located at the bottom of the screen throughout the webinar. Sharon and I will try to answer as many questions as possible in the session following the main presentation. Should any questions remain unanswered, we will reply by email. The webinar will be recorded and an on-demand version will be available shortly after the webinar on the Biorad Antibodies website. Should you encounter any technical problems during the webinar, please click on the question mark at the bottom of the screen. This will bring up the technical guide which describes solutions for the most common technical problems. In addition to webinars, we regularly post blog articles, not just on flow cytometry, but on other applications and research areas. We also have blog posts on current scientific discussions and the latest biomedical discoveries. Feel free to check out the blog and comment on one of the many articles. In addition, you can follow us on social media and stay up to date on antibody resources, news and products. Our social media channels can be accessed by the icons at the bottom of the screen. During the webinar, you, you can interact with us on Twitter by submitting questions or webinar feedback using the hashtag BioradWebinars. I hope you enjoyed the webinar, and I'm now handing over to Sharon. Thank you, Mike, and welcome. For today's webinar, I will begin with a brief apoptosis overview covering the common methods used for detection and the advantages and disadvantages of using a flow-based technique to measure apoptosis. I'll then move on to describe several flow assays with example data and some tips specific to each assay. The final part will cover general tips and tricks for apoptosis assays and some pitfalls to avoid in order to obtain quality and meaningful data. There are many types of cell death, the two major ones being necrosis and apoptosis. Necrosis is a form of cell death caused by external factors such as infections, toxins or trauma, which results in the unre unregulated digestion of the cell and release of cellular contents leading to inflammation. In contrast to this, apoptosis is a form of programmed cell death which is highly controlled and regulated and often no inflammation occurs, providing cells are ingested by phagocytes before they release their intracellular contents. It is very important during embryogenesis and development for example, our fingers are formed in a developing embryo due to apoptosis of the cells between the digits. However, when the apoptosis balance is disrupted, it can contribute to diseases. If apoptosis is inhibited, cells live beyond their natural life and still replicate, passing on faulty machinery and mutations to their progeny, increasing the likelihood of the cell becoming cancerous or diseased. In fact, one of the ten hallmarks of cancer is evading apoptosis. In contrast, accelerated apoptosis, which results in killing of more cells than necessary, is implicated in diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It is also dysregulated during HIV progression into AIDS. This occurs primarily due to CD4 T cell depletion. One mechanism through which this occurs is uncontrolled apoptosis that is too rapid for the body's bone marrow to replace the lost cells. Learning more about the mechanism of cell death in diseases can aid in drug discovery and the understanding of pro- and anti-inflammatory responses cell death can induce. 
Many other types of cell death are also known, including necroptosis, anoikis, and pyrotopsis, to name a few. Today we will be focusing on apoptosis, but some of the assays mentioned may also be useful to include when studying other forms of cell death. We'd like to focus today on the methods for detection using flow cytometry, so I'll keep the apoptosis pathway description relatively short. For more detailed information on this pathway and alternative applications, please see Biorad's dedicated webpage or alternatively listen to our previous apoptosis webinar available on demand. As can be seen in this simplified graphic, there are two main pathways for apoptosis, the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. They differ by the way apoptosis is activated, and in the early stages, distinctive proteins are involved. However, the pathways do eventually converge at the point of caspase activation. If we first take a look at the intrinsic pathway on the left, this process starts with the activation of apoptosis proteins, including BCL2, homologous antagonist or killer, BAC, and BCL2 associated X protein, BACs. These proteins break down the energy factory of the cell, the mitochondria. They form oligomers and insert themselves into the outer mitochondrial membrane, eventually causing holes in the membrane, leading to a decrease in mitochondrial membrane potential. Once the outer membrane of the mitochondria is permeabilized, this is considered the point of no return and apoptosis can't be reversed. A cocktail of factors are released from the mitochondria once membrane integrity is compromised. One such factor is cytochrome C, which binds to a cytoplasmic scaffold protein called apoptotic protease activating factor 1. This results in the formation of a quaternary protein structure called the apoptosome that amplifies the death response. Apoptosis is ultimately driven by two classes of highly specialised proteases, called caspases. Initiator caspases are activated by self-cleavage, and effector caspases are activated downstream by initiator caspases. Activation of the second pathway, the extrinsic pathway, which is shown on the right, is through binding a specific cell surface ligands, such as FAS ligand or tumor necrosis factor alpha, to their corresponding death receptors, FAS, also called CD95, or TNF receptor 1. Once activated, death receptors homologarize and recruit caspase 8 and adapter proteins such as FAD to the C-terminal end of the death receptor to form the death-inducing signaling complex, or DISC for short. Caspase 8 is activated in the DISC complex and subsequently activates other caspases. The mechanism of late-stage apoptosis is common for both pathways. Characteristics include shredding of DNA, cell shrinkage and membrane blebbing. In this webinar, we will take a look at the different methods of measuring apoptosis and how they fit into the pathway. Flow cytometry is of course not the only way to study apoptosis. Microscopy is a commonly used technique which can be used for both live cell imaging and fixed cells or tissue. Live cell imaging can be used to look at membrane blebbing, however, this often underestimates the number of apoptotic cells as cells in early apoptosis fail to display gross morphological modifications. For studying fixed tissue sections or cell smears, microscopy is the most appropriate technique. In the example on the right, heart tissue is stained by immunohistochemistry using an anti-APAF1 antibody. APAF1 binds to cytochrome C released from the mitochondria, which leads to caspase activation. Hematoxylin and acridine orange are other microscopy techniques that can be used to visualize macrophages that have engulfed apoptotic cells. The drawbacks of this technique is that interpretation is often operator dependent and the assay is low throughput. Western blotting can be used to look at key apoptotic proteins, such as BCL2 in this example. You can also look at protein activation by detecting phosphorylated proteins. However, 
a big limitation is that you can only look at one cell population. So in order to look at a particular cell type in a mixed cell population, such as whole blood, would require a cell sorting step beforehand. Like microscopy, it's also relatively low throughput. ELISA can be used to measure parts of the apoptosis pathway, such as caspase activation and cytoplasmic nucleosomes released into the cell cytoplasm following DNA fragmentation. This assay is high throughput, simple to carry out, and gives quantitative data. However, again, it can't be used to study a single cell type in a mixed cell population without sorting and culturing beforehand. As this technique is based on detection of a soluble ligand, it can only be used to measure some aspects of the apoptotic process. Flow cytometry is a powerful method that is becoming increasingly popular to study several components of the apoptosis pathway for the reasons I'm going to give next. One of its major advantages is that a large number of cells can be analysed in a short period of time to give quantitative data. Many of the apoptosis assay reagents come in a range of fluorophores, for example, our caspase kits. This allows easy combination with immunophenotyping panels and identification of subpopulations without the need for cell sorting beforehand. You can even combine different apoptosis assays. As with all techniques, flow does have its limitations. It can't be used for histological samples. It requires more cells and microscopy methods. So, for cells that don't replicate often, such as neurons, then flow would not be the best choice of technique. Although I mentioned that you can combine assays in immunophenotyping panels, you do need to be aware that you can't look at intracellular proteins, such as BCL2, which would require cell permeabilization, with reagents that require an intact cell membrane, such as propidium iodide. Finally, a lot of the dyes used in the apoptosis assays are unfixable. Although as the assays are quick to perform, I found that running them through a cytometer on the same day is not a problem. Now I'd like to move on to the assays, with some examples and assay-specific tips. Annexin-5 staining is one of the most common methods used to detect apoptosis by flow. The staining is quick, and it does not require fixation. In early apoptosis, phosphatidylserine, or PS for short, is exposed at the cell surface. Annexin-5 binds to the membrane phospholipid in the presence of calcium ions. The addition of PI staining allows you to distinguish between early and late stage apoptosis. As cells progress down the apoptotic pathway, they lose membrane integrity, allowing PI to pass into the cell, which it's unable to do in live cells with an intact membrane. However, this assay does not tease apart individual stages of apoptosis or distinguish between the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. In this example, Jerkats were treated with starosporin, a protein kinase inhibitor that induces apoptosis by caspase-dependent and independent mechanisms, or a DMSO control, which is a vehicle for starosporin. Compared to the control, you can see that there was a slight increase in cells in early apoptosis at one hour, and by six hours there is a large proportion of cells in both early and late apoptosis. Some annexin-5 assay-specific tips include the need to be aware that the buffer provided with annexin-5 contains calcium ions. Any variations to this can affect staining. As PS flipping is reversible, stain samples should be analysed as soon as possible. Annexin-5 comes in various fluorophore formats, so there's likely to be a format that can be easily incorporated into your current staining panel. In the example I've shown here, I've used PI as the live dead stain. We are not limited to using PI, as there are other dyes that could be used instead, such as DRAC and DAPI. As mentioned previously, induction of the extrinsic pathway begins by the binding of death induces ligands to their receptor. Upon binding, receptors cluster together and undergo a conformational change in the intracellular domain to reveal a death domain which allows the recruitment of apoptotic proteins to the receptor. This complex is called the death-inducing signaling complex, or DISC. Finally, a caspase is recruited, which becomes activated 
and initiates the apoptotic cascade. Six death receptors have been characterized in humans, including FAS or CD95, trail receptor 1, trail receptor 2, and TNF receptor 1. In several cancers, the death receptor expression is downregulated. It may be useful to understand the death receptor expression pattern alongside the apoptosis signaling pathway. In this example, we have stained human blood for CD95 along with a counter stain, CD45. A live dead marker, PI, was included to allow the gating of live cells only. Dead cells can bind non-specifically to antibodies, so this will avoid false positives. Based on the forward and side scatter plot shown on the left, we can gate around the lymphocyte population to look at CD95 expression as shown in the right plot. In addition, using the same sample, we can also look at CD95 expression in the monocyte popula population, again, based on forward and side scatter gating. This basic gating can help analyze different cell populations, but you can easily add in surface markers to identify cell types more accurately. Also, you could look at subpopulations, such as activated versus unactivated T cells, to determine changes in expression of the death receptors. Some assay-specific tips are to include a live dead marker, ensure you do careful sample prep, especially when using primary cells, to ensure you collect data from healthy cells. Also, include an FC block, which is particularly important when looking at monocytes. In contrast to the receptor-mediated initiation of the extrinsic pathway, the intrinsic pathway is initiated by triggers such as DNA damage. This activates the BCL2 signaling pathway, which in turn affects the mitochondria. Preapoptotic members of the BCL2 family are inserted into the mitochondrial membrane. This results in pores that proapoptotic molecules, such as cytochrome C, are released that causes a collapse of the electrochemical gradient across the mitochondrial membrane. At this point, the cell is committed to apoptosis. There are two main types of dyes used to measure this, the first of which are TMRE and TMRM, which measures the collapse of the mitochondrial membrane by a reduction in fluorescence. TMRE, which is red fluorescent, accumulates within the slightly negative and alkaline environment of the mitochondria. In apoptotic cells, a loss of membrane potential is reflected by loss of fluorescent staining in the mitochondria as the dye escapes due to membrane disruption. In this example, jerkats were treated with CCCP, which depolarizes the mitochondrial membrane, resulting in leaking of the dye from the mitochondria and drop in fluorescence, as you can see in the histogram. There is a shift of the signal to the left, as shown in red, compared to the control in black. Moving on to some TMRE specific tips. Data is usually measured by changes in the MFI between samples. So including an unstained sample gives you a reference point for background fluorescence. Mitochondrial mass can also influence the MFI, as in the larger the mitochondria, the more TMRE will be present. Therefore, it would be a good idea to also check mitochondrial mass and see if there's any changes to this and take this into account during your analysis. The second type of mitochondrial dye I'd like to mention is JC1. This is another dye that accumulates within mitochondria that forms aggregates that are red fluorescent. When the membrane potential drops, it allows JC1 to disperse throughout the cell cytosol and exist in its monomeric form, which exhibits a green fluorescence. In this example, we use styrosporin to induce apoptosis in jerkats. You can see the shift in the cell population in the right dot plot. Cells have moved to the lower gate following treatment as they lose red fluorescence and gain green fluorescence. Some tips for using JC1 is that it's more photosensitive than some other apoptosis reagents, so it should be protected from light. As the dye forms an aggregated or a monomeric form, enough time should be given for it to reach equilibrium. If the dye is used at a concentration too high, it can generate artifacts. So, as with the other dyes, it should be titrated for your cell type of interest. 
Now I'd like to move on to a group of important mediators of apoptosis, caspases. Caspases are proteases that cleave protein substrates at specific amino acid residues. Caspase activation occurs early in the extrinsic pathway and in the intrinsic pathway following mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization. All caspases are synthesized in inactive forms, referred to as procaspases, that require dimerization, oligomerization and cleavage for activation. There are two main forms, the initiator caspases, 2, 8, 9, 10 and 12. These cleave and activate downstream effector caspases, 3, 6 and 7, which modify proteins and drive apoptosis. Caspase involvement in apoptosis can be measured in flow using monoclonal antibodies that are specific for the activated form, or more easily by using small inhibitor molecules conjugated to a fluorophore. I would describe the second method, which involves using inhibitor molecules in a quick and easy to use kit. These kits use a cell permeable and non-toxic reagent called fluorochrome inhibitor of caspases, or FLICA. All of the FLICA inhibitor molecules consist of three components. Firstly, a fluorophore. In this case, carboxylfluorosine, or FAM, excitable by a 4 8 laser and emitting at 518 nanometers. This is bound to a caspase-specific binding sequence consisting of four amino acids, which directs it to a specific caspase. In this example, LEHD, which is specific to caspase 9. Finally, this is attached to fluoromethylketone, known as FMK, which binds irreversibly to the caspase active site. BioRAD has a range of flicker kits to detect a wide range of caspases, which you can see in the table. These detect caspases involved in different parts of the apoptotic pathway. Also, there is a polycaspase kit. This is particularly useful to get an overview to determine if any caspase is activated before investigating more in depth the specific alterations in this pathway. Formats other than FAM are available, which include SR Flicker, which is red, and a far red dye, Flicker 660. This allows flexibility if you are using an immunophenotyping panel. For example, it's likely you'll be able to find a format that will fit into an already optimized staining panel. Or if you are using antibody that you only have available in, say, FITSI, then you'll be able to use the SR or 660 flicker format to detect caspase activation. In this example, jerkats were treated with starosporin for six hours, then stained with FAM flicker caspase 37 and PI. When the flicker kits are used in combination with a DNA dye such as PI in this example, it allows you to identify four different cell states. The live PI flicker double negative population in the bottom left quadrant, the early apoptotic flicker positive PI negative population in the lower right quadrant, the late apoptotic flicker and PI double positive population in the upper right quadrant, and finally the flicker negative PI positive necrotic cells in the upper left quadrant. As mentioned, we have flicker kits that can measure different types of caspases and polycaspases. We'd like to show you example data of an initiator and effector caspase. In these examples, jerkats were treated with starosporin or campathesin, a topoise summarized inhibitor that binds to TOPO1 and DNA complex, resulting in a ternary complex that prevents DNA re-ligation, therefore causing DNA damage and apoptosis. In this first example, we have looked at activation of an initiator caspase, caspase 9. In our second example, we've looked at caspase 37 activation, one of the effector caspases. In both cases, you can see an increase in caspase activation with more cells 
in the right hand side quadrants after activation. Some tips when using the caspase assays is that apoptosis should be shown in more than one way. Caspases can be activated in other processes other than cell death, such as in erythroblasts during erythroid differentiation. We have a caspase 1 kit which can be used for pyrotopsis detection, one of the other forms of cell death. Also, these kits can be used for microscopy. Now we move on to detecting the latter stage of apoptosis, at which point cells undergo nuclear fragmentation and lose DNA content. Using a fluorophore that binds to DNA and analysis by flow is a rapid and quantitative measure of looking at this loss of DNA, seen as a sub-G1 peak. This assay also gives additional cell cycle information of live cells. There are different methods to look at this, including staining of cells or nuclei. In our example, we use a method that stains nuclear DNA with PI in a hypertonic solution. This method removes the majority of RNA, so RNA treatment is not required. You can see the different stages of the cell cycle here, with the sub-G1 to the far left of the histogram. A time course experiment of cells pre-treated with starosporin before the nuclei staining assay shows clearly how a sub-G1 peak develops over time. Before any treatment, there is only 2.5% of cells in the sub-G1 region, reaching to nearly 25% after 8-hour treatments. There are several important tips for a successful sub-G1 assay. You may have noticed that these histograms are shown on a linear scale. This is necessary to see the sub-G1 peak. Other methods use cells rather than whole nuclei, so in that case doublets must be removed as they can mimic cells in the G2M phase. Also, you need to include an RNA treatment step, as PA binds to RNA as well as DNA, unless you use a DNA dye that doesn't bind to RNA, such as DAPI. Some necrotic cells can display a degree of DNA degradation. Sub-G1 peaks may also contain nuclear fragments, clumps of chromosomes, or micronuclei. Therefore, it's not bona fide proof of apoptotic death. Therefore, for these two reasons, it's best practice to perform more than one assay to confirm the apoptotic status of your cells. Also, be aware of what cells you are studying and what the cell cycle profile should look like. Some cells, such as cancer cells, or cell lines such as HeLa, may have different end number, and therefore their profile would look different. Now moving on to the last section for today, some general tips and tricks for accurately measuring apoptosis using flow cytometry. First of all, include controls. Biological controls include a positive and negative control of your assay, so that you can be sure it's working as expected. In the assay shown today, the vehicle of the apoptosis drug was used as the negative control, which was DMSO. As this is known to induce apoptosis, it was an important control. We hope the examples shown today have given you suggestions of positive control reagents that can be used. Also, you need flow-specific controls, such as FMO controls in large staining panels. This will help you know where to set gates. For more information on this, and other flow-specific controls can be found at the Controls webinar, which is available on demand. Titration. Some assays give a non-specific signal if the dye or antibody is not titrated correctly. You should use your positive control for titration experiments and be aware that the optimal concentration may differ between cell types. By calculating the stain index, you can determine the optimal concentration to use. Be aware of kinetics. Apoptosis is a dynamic process and therefore there is a short time window that an apoptotic cell will display each characteristic. Therefore, different methods can produce different results dependent on time. For example, even if you see nothing in an endpoint DNA fragmentation assay, this does not mean that the apoptotic cascade is not in its early stages. If you are unsure if apoptosis is occurring and want a quick yes or no answer to decide whether to pursue this line of research, then as we have mentioned, the polycaspase and an XM5 kit would be good starting points.
The plots on the right show jerkat cells treated with styrosporin and stained for polycaspase. As this kit captures several steps in the apoptotic cascade, the time apoptotic cells can be detected by this assay is longer than with other methods. Another thing to consider is gating. Be sure you know where to set gates. This example of an XM5 staining of jerkats shows how placing of gates can alter your results. If you gate on the main population, also seen in the DMSO control, then it doesn't appear that there's many late-stage apoptotic or necrotic cells in the upper right quadrant. However, if you instead gate on the cells to the left of this population, you can see that this is where all the dying cells sit in the forward and side scatter plot. And if you gate on all of the cells, you get the full picture. Therefore, in this example, it is vital you have a large gate to include cells in all stages of cell death. Otherwise, it would give you misleading results. You need to have consistent gating throughout your experiment and be aware that cells, cell size, shape and refractive properties may change during apoptosis. Another thing to be aware of is staining buffer. Whilst normal staining buffers used for antibody staining may be appropriate for some assays, others will require specialised buffers. For example, one which I've already mentioned is the need for calcium ions in the Inexium 5 staining buffer. Think about your protocol. If you are using a DNA dye, do you need to include an RNA treatment step to avoid also staining RNA? The staining order can be important, such as, are you going to include any antibodies to detect your cell population of interest? If so, are any of your target antigens intracellular, therefore requiring, requiring a permalization step? When using apoptosis detection dyes, often they need to be run on a cytometer fairly quick. For example, JC1, which we mentioned earlier. So in those cases, you would stain for surface markers before the dye. What about the temperature of staining? Some of the assays we've shown today require incubation at 37 degrees. If your assay using, uses a dye, can it be fixed? If not, you need to be able to run your cells through a flow cytometer the same day. You need to understand your cytometer configuration of lasers and filters to know what fluorophores can be detected on it. There may be some compensation required if using more than one parameter. Therefore, you need to remember to include single stain controls. This is explained in more details in one of Biorad's previous webinars on fluorescence compensation. Also, include an unstained sample in order to check for any autofluorescence of your cells. High autofluorescence in a specific channel will give a loss of signal resolution and a decrease in signal sensitivity. Therefore, ideally avoid using these channels when choosing your fluorophores. Also, be aware that dead cells autofluoresce, so it's another reason to include a live dead marker in your staining panel. As we are close to the end of this webinar, I'd like to recap the reagents I've described today and where they fit into the simplified apoptotic pathway we showed at the start. PS flipping in the cell membrane can be detected by an exin 5. Death receptors can be studied using antibodies against FAS, TNF receptor 1 and TNF receptor 2. Mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization can be determined using reagents that measure the mitochondrial membrane potential, TMRM, TMRE, and JC1. Caspase activation can be measured using Biorad's range of flicker kits. Finally, I described using the sub-G1 assay to look at nuclear fragmentation using PI. Serine activation is also known to have a role in apoptosis. Serine protease activity is greater in apoptotic cells compared to healthy cells with inhibition shown to prevent DNA fragmentation following apoptosis induction. Look out for our new kit, fluorescent labelled inhibitors of serine proteases or FLISP kit that will be launched soon, which can measure intracellular chymotrypsin-like serine protease activity.
If you would like more information on flow cytometry, including building multicolour panels, controls, protocols, our new fluorophore poster, gating strategies, and an updated flow guide covering the basics of flow cytometry, please go to the resources page on the BioRad Antibody website. There you will also find resources for other antibody-based applications such as Western Blot, IHC, ELISA and Immunofluorescence. In our resources section, we have other flow cytometry specific webinars covering areas such as controls and compensation. We also have application-based webinars on topics, for example, mastering IHC experiments and immunoprecipitation, and research area webinars covering areas such as measuring adaptive and innate immune responses. All of these are available to view on demand. And so, as we come to the last slide today, I just want to inform you that in addition to the apoptosis reagents we have mentioned today, we have antibodies, reagents, controls and instruments here at BioRad to help you with all your flow cytometry experiments. Antibodies, both single unit and cocktails, in a range of fluorophores, viability dyes, proliferation dyes and our easy to use apoptosis kits described today are available from our website. We also have an automated S3E cell sorter and a new ZE5 cell analyzer. This innovative new cytometer has the flexibility to meet a broad range of needs, whether it is two parameter or 28, from single tubes to 384 well plates. The ZE5 is accessible for novice flow cytometry users with a fluorophore selector, a spectral viewer showing fluorophore spillover and quick action buttons to allow selection of the next setup step with ease and yet flexible enough for the most experienced user with an extra forward scatter detector for small particles, absolute counting without beads and the ability to add reagents to your samples in real time for kinetic experiments. And that brings me to the end of today's webinar. I'd like to thank you for listening and now we have time to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Sharon, for such a great webinar on how to use flow cytometry to detect apoptosis. And now we have some time for some questions. Uh, so I'll answer a couple first. And the first question is, you use several reagents to induce apoptosis. What are the best positive controls? Well, the reagents we use in this webinar were common reagents that are known to induce apoptosis in many cell lines and many cell types. For example, we used camptothecin, originally developed as an anti-cancer therapeutic, uh, which is the DNA topoisomerase inhibitor, and this leads to double-strand DNA breaks, thus inducing apoptosis via the intrinsic pathway. We also use starosporin, and this is a general protein kinase inhibitor that prevents binding of ATP to inhibit kinase action. And this is known to induce apoptosis through both kinase-dependent and kinase-independent pathways. So it's a very potent activator of both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways. There are many other common methods. Um, you could in use dexamethasone for apoptosis of thymocytes. There's an anti-FAS antibody, which clones CH11. And this can induce FAS-mediated apoptosis in cells such as jerkats. And you can even irradiate your cells to induce double-strand breaks and thus induce apoptosis. It's difficult to say which is the best reagent, but it will depend on your assay. And it depends on many things, such as what part of the pathway, if at all, you're interested in. Depend on the cell type, the species you're using, their sensitivity to your apoptosis uh, induction reagent, and the length of time you choose to induce uh, apoptosis. You should optimize the amount of your apoptosis uh, inducer and the length of time your cells are incubated. As as Sharon mentioned earlier, this could affect your ability to detect certain parts of each pathway. So it, it's difficult to say, again, which is the best control. And another question here. Which of the methods shown today is the simplest or best, me best method to detect apoptosis? Well. In my experience, 
I would say annexin-5 staining is probably the simplest and easiest method to use uh, by, for flow cytometry detection of apoptosis, and it's probably the most common method used. The reason for this is that the phosphatidyl serine flipping occurs throughout apoptosis and is not specific for any one stage. It can be easily fitted into a common standard antibody staining protocol as well. Uh, so you, you can detect lots of uh, different cell types if you wish. You do have to ensure you have the calcium in the buffer, otherwise the annexin no longer binds. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, you should always include a live dead stain to exclude dead cells. Um, I always used to analyze quickly after my staining so I could get an accurate uh, measurement of apoptosis. Um, however, annexin isn't the only staining as we've shown, and it's a personal choice. Caspase staining using the flicker kits is also easy, and this works for all cell types, and will give you a similar readout if you use a live dead dye. Um, for convenience, the sub-G1 assay is uh, often a very good way to detect apoptosis because you fix your samples in ethanol, and then you can put them in the fridge for several weeks, um, thus analyzing at your convenience. So it's really up to you. So we have a couple of technical questions, so I'll pass over to Sharon so she can answer those. Hey, thank you, Mike. So we've had a question come through asking, can I fix my samples so I can analyze lots of samples together? So this is dependent on the assay that you're using. So the mitochondrial dyes, um, TMRE and JC1 that I've mentioned, are unfixable. So these do need running the same day. However, there are ones that can be fixed, such as an XIN5. There are some things to bear in mind, though, for an XIN5. You need to keep samples in the binding buffer, as once removed, an XIN5 will fall off. So fix your cells in your choice of fixative, diluted in binding buffer. Also, you'll need to use a fixable live dead stain, such as VivaFix, which comes in a range of different fluorophores. Our cast-based flicker kits can also be fixed and stored for 24 hours before running. However, use a formaldehyde solution for fixation, as ethanol and methanol-based fixatives can inhibit the flicker label. Again, also make sure you choose a live dead stain that can be fixed. And obviously any antibodies you've included in your assay can be fixed. However, do bear in mind that some fluorophores are sensitive to fixation. PE and APC are large proteins, and they will be effect affected by fixation. Unlike the smaller fluorophores, such as Alexa 488 and Fitzy. So just be aware to choose your panel carefully if you want to fix. So the next question I'd like to answer is one we've had that's asking about mitochondrial mass. So the question we've had is, you've mentioned measuring mitochondrial mass when using JC1 and TMRE. How do I do this? So in larger mitochondria, the more TMRE or JC1 can accumulate, therefore resulting in a larger MFI value. Therefore, this can skew your data. For example, if you're looking at mitochondrial membrane potential following a drug treatment that increases the mitochondrial size, you would need to normalize um, the MFI in the mitochondrial mass region of each sample, including the untreated, of course. Mitochondrial mass can be easily measured by flow. The easiest and quickest method is to use a dye, which stains mitochondria regardless of membrane potential. For example, mitotracker green or NAO. So I'm going to take one more question and then I'll hand back to Mike. So we've been asked if um, you can combine apoptosis assays and which ones would you recommend? So yes, you can. A lot of these different techniques work well in combination, and it can be a good way of confirming apoptosis. First of all, think about what your question is and what you want to get out of the result. The easy measurements to combine include looking at CD95 staining levels to determine the expression of death receptors at the same time as apoptosis staining with, say, a flicker um, kit or an XIN5. This way, you may be able to link apoptosis induction to the levels of apoptosis. So I mentioned that we'll soon have available our serine fliss kit. So these can easily be combined with a cast-based flicker kit. 
This allows the activation of caspases to be measured simultaneously with the less characterized serum proteases. So you get a fuller picture of what is happening in a single cell and helps you to determine the role of the different proteases. If you wanted to look at a general apoptosis marker such as the Nexin-5 and a specific part of the pathway, you can combine an Nexin-5 with a caspase flicker kit such as caspase 9 and that would tell you about the general levels and more specifically about the intrinsic pathway. One thing to be aware of is to check the buffer compatibility between assays, especially in Nexin-5, which as we've already mentioned does require a special buffer. Also, be aware of fluorescence spillover, so take care to choose the right fluorophore formats for your assay to minimise compensation. Also, as with all the assays, include the right controls and a live dead stain. OK, I'm now going to hand you back to Mike. OK, thank you. Um, I had a question here. It says, are flicker reagents and cell service reagents available for rat? Well, flicker reagents uh, for caspase uh, detection will work in all uh, cells. So yes, they will work on rat. And uh, here at Biorad, we have lots of cell surface reagents available for, for rat. We have lots of antibodies to enable you to detect uh, all the different cell types that may be relevant for your uh, experiments. So I hope that helps. And Looking again here. Oh, finally, I have one more question, and this is that can I measure phagocytosis of apoptotic cells by flow cytometry? Well, we've not really mentioned the role of apoptosis in immune responses today. We try to focus just on how to do the assays. Um, but phagocytosis is an important way in which apoptotic bodies are removed, uh, helping to resolve an immune response. And you'd be pleased to know that it is possible to detect and measure phagocytosis using flow cytometry. You'll be able to get a percentage of cells that are phagocytosing in a large population, uh, which is one of the benefits of flow cytometry over other methods. You'll have to find an appropriate way to label your apoptotic cells. You could use a fixable live dead dye, such as Vivafix, uh, or you could use FITSI, you could use CFSE, or you could even use aliphatic amine binding dyes such as TAMRA, which is what I've done in the past. Cells that have phagocytosed the apopt apoptotic bodies will then fluoresce, and this can be measured. However, you'll have to be able to distinguish between apoptotic bodies that have been internalized and those that are on the cell surface. So you'll have to have an appropriate quenching of the cell surface staining. And this is often using uh, reagents such as tripan blue or crystal violet. I found that I had to perform lots of washes of the apoptotic cells after staining to prevent excess dye. Otherwise, everything was stained with the dye. And this is something that you have to be aware of with a lot of these uh, apoptosis reagents, is to titrate them down very carefully to make sure you can detect specific apoptosis. Um, quite often you have to titrate and check the kinetics of your phagocytosis because you will find that you will either get no phagocytosis or everything will be phagocytosed. Personally, I'd also check uh, using microscopy uh, for phagocytic cups using F-actin as well, as this will confirm that you have phagocytosis. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. So I'd just like to say thank you for listening. And thank you to Sharon for the, hosting the webinar today. Any questions that we've not had a chance to answer, we will email out and we'll give you uh, the best reply we can. And just to let you know that this webinar will be available on demand. Uh, just follow the link in the email that will be sent to you uh, tomorrow. And that, once again, thanks for listening. And that's all for now. Bye.